Good afternoon to you all from a, a very sunny Middlesbrough. Um, I'm lying, it's actually quite overcast outside, but welcome to this afternoon's uh, webinar, uh, which is going to be um, facilitated by myself and led by none other than Mr. Wong, who I shall introduce in just a moment. Um, a, a real warm welcome to you all from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, who we must thank for supporting us in this endeavor, uh, hosting the platform to uh, put out the webinars for your educational benefit. Now, I, I must um, just draw your attention to a couple of things that will happen in the next few minutes. Mr. Wong is going to give you some education. At some point, you will be able to um, answer on a poll. Uh, that will be open just for a, a matter of seconds. And if you could very quickly put your questions and answers down, that'd be excellent. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button, which you can click on and ask questions. And I shall endeavor to answer those for you if Mr. Wong does not uh, answer those already. Um, 30 seconds about myself. Uh, I'm one of the regional surgical advisors here in Middlesbrough. Um, but more importantly, let me introduce you to Mr. Wong. Uh, Mr. Wong in his college photo looks very young. He's a little bit older now, graduated from uh, a, a city far down south in Bristol and then moved his way further north up to the, to the northeast. He's an excellently skilled vascular surgeon. He is an examiner for the uh, FRCS vascular surgery exams and the European Board of Exams. And he's done those exams himself as well and got top marks. So he's a very intelligent young man. We also have to pay a lot of respect to him as he is, uh, sits on the um, CQC board also for vascular surgery. So a lot of experience, and he's going to bring you 20 minutes or so uh, on this webinar. My patient has a pulsatile lump, and how do I approach this? So I'm going to hand over to Mr. Wong now, and I'll try and answer your questions as we go along. Peng. Right, thank you very much, Barney, and uh, thank you very much for the very generous introduction. So welcome uh, to everyone to the uh, webinar this afternoon, which is kindly supported by the Royal College and the Royal uh, and the RSA network. And we're gonna talk about the case of a patient with pulsatile lung, how we can approach this problem. So we're gonna briefly talk about what an aneurysm is, how you would diagnose it, how you would treat it, and how you would time your treatment. So, we're going to quickly go through the aneurysm definition. It's an abnormal dilatation of a vessel more than 50% of its adjacent diameter. On average, a diameter of abdominal aorta is around 2 cm. And abdominal aorta is considered aneurysmal if it's more than 3 cm. So how would you classify it if it's between 2.1 and 2.9? We call it an ectatic uh, aorta. So this word, for those of you who love trivia, uh, the, the word aneurysms originated from the Greek word aneurysma, meaning dilatation. So a little bit of trivia for today. In terms of the epidemiology, around one in 25 men between the age of 65 to 74 will have the risk of abdominal aortic aneurysm. Up to uh, six times men, uh, six times more likely than women to have abdominal aortic aneurysm. The picture on the right there is that of Albert Einstein in the 1950s when he was in his 60s. He had a ruptured triple A, not ruptured triple A, he had an aneurysm repair done uh, nonetheless by Nissen, famous for Nissen follow application. Uh, aneurysm screening is currently therefore available now in men above the age of 65 years old. The risk factors, as in all arterial disease, smoking is the strongest risk factor, followed by conditions such as hypertension, other connective tissue disorders, such as Marfan's atherosclerotic loss polycystic kidney disease, and also family history. Now, if you look at family history, it's important to know that if a male first-degree relative has an abdominal aortic aneurysm, the other first-degree relatives has a 12 times chance of um, developing abdominal aortic aneurysm as well. So it is important that if you have a patient with abdominal aortic aneurysm, don't forget to warn their first-degree male relative when they get to the age of 50 to at least have an ultrasound scan to show or or, or disprove the presence of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Pathophysiology, abdominal aortic aneurysm is multifactorial, and we think it is commonly due to results of breakdown of well-organized proteins of the aortic wall, such as elastin and collagen, um, and in the absence of elastin and collagen or, or decrease in their, 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 their volume, then the abdominal aortic wall will destabilize and increases the risk of it dilating. The following mechanisms are considered important in abdominal aortic aneurysm development. This is 
um, combination of proteolytic breakdown of aortic wall connective tissue, inflammation and in immune response, combination of my biomechanical wall stress, and the interplay of molecular genetics. So all these four factors come together to cause abdominal aortic aneurysm. What are the other rarer causes? They are things like infection, and more commonly you see that with people with gram-positive organisms such as Staphylococcus. So invasion of the intima media from, from this infection could result in seeding of abscess and, and eventually weakening of the wall and aneurysmal change. You also see this quite commonly in pseudoaneurysms in certain areas where there's increased um, IVDUs, for example, and also pseudoaneurysms differ atrogenically from angiography where the uh, artery that's been punctured does not heal and become um, aneurysmal. These are images of uh, aneurysms, starting from the left, you've got a normal vessel, then we, we move on to circular aneurysm where there's a abnormal dilatation of part of the wall, and then you can also get fusiform, fusiform aneurysm where it's um, dilated overall. You can also get a pseudo or false aneurysm. As we mentioned before, this is where part of the wall of the artery is weakened. The blood then leaks up from the, from the artery, but it is contained within the extravascular connective tissue uh, and well-contained hematoma. And this pseudo aneurysm does have a risk of, of, of rupture. We can also get dissection, even though dissection itself is not uh, considered as aneurysm, but it can predispose to uh, an aneurysmal change in the long term. We can also classify abdominal aortic aneurysm in relation to the renal arteries. We could call it suprarenal aneurysm when it involves the original one or more visceral arteries, but if it does not extend beyond the, the, the diaphragm. We call it pararenal when the renal artery arises from the aneurysmal aorta itself. We can call it just a renal aneurysm when the aneurysm originates just beyond the origins of the renal arteries. And in this case, there's no segment of non-aneurysmal aorta distal to the renal arteries. We also have commonly infrarenal aneurysm, which is what we normally like to see as vascular surgeons as they're probably easy to manage. And these aneurysms often originate distal to renal arteries. There's a segment of non-aneurysmal aorta that we can either stitch to, or we can either put a stent to land and seal. So typically, what sort of symptoms and signs do you get with patients with abdominal aortic aneurysm? Majority of them are asymptomatic, and most of the patients that we see are often found incidentally on clinical examination or incidentally on ultrasound or CT scan for other abdominal pathology. So symptoms and signs of abdominal aortic aneurysm depend on the complications arising from the aneurysm. Now, before this, the preceding few weeks, we talk about causes of bowel obstruction, and we can classify that into within the lumen, within the wall, and outside the lumen. And I'm going to teach you a simple way to remembering complications of aneurysms. We can classify them easily to complications arising from within the lumen itself. We can get thrombosis within the, uh, within the aneurysm. I've certainly seen a nine centimeter aneurysm that's completely thrombosed. And you can see here, being shown in the top right, you've got, you have a CT scan of an abdominal aortic aneurysm and a red arrow pointing to thrombus within the, the aneurysm itself. And this thrombus in the long term could, could progress and completely occlude the lumen. And similarly, if there's thrombus within the vessel, it could embolize. And with that, you can get blue toe syndrome where the toes are, uh, have patches of, of ischemia. Uh, and in the long term, if it's not resolved, if the arteries are all silted out, you can get ischemic limbs. Within the wall, what could we get? We can get dissection, as seen in the picture on the bottom right. The arrow is pointing to the, the flat of dissection. So dissection could further weaken the wall, and typically with dissection, patients will get pain. And you can also get rupture, as we know. And there's a picture in the, bot in the bottom, and the arrow pointing to the extravasation of, of contrast out of the lumen of the abdominal aortic aneurysm. Outside the lumen, what could you do? It could compress. It could compress extrinsically on the duodenum. It can result in gastric outlet obstruction. I've certainly seen a case like that. It could compress on the ureter, it will result in ureteric colic. And again, we've seen cases like that. It could also fistulate, i.e. it could form a connection with a small bowel, or what we call an eoteroenteric fistula. Typically, this patient will have a small harrow bleed, um, a small harrow hematemesis, followed by a massive GI bleed. So you, again, if you don't consider this, it may be too late to, to, to plan your management. 
It can also have aneurysms fistulating to the IVC, what we call a aortal cable fistula. If you look at the CT scan on the right, the arrow is pointing to the IVC. This is an arterial phase imaging. You should normally shouldn't see contrast in the IVC, but in this case, you can see the IVC highlighted quite clearly. So blood is now gushing from the aorta straight back into the IVC, and as a result of that, there's a risk of right-sided heart failure. They come in with shortness of breath. They may present with lower limb edema, and when you examine them, you may feel an abdominal thrill, and these patients potentially could go into renal failure. Um, what else could it fistulate into? It could also fistulate into a left renal vein, and again, typically, uh, similar to the IVC uh, fistula, these patients could also get right-sided heart failure. Now, abdominal aortic aneurysm is recommended to be re for, for repair when it gets to five and a half centimeter, if these patients are suitably fit, and also have predicted life expectancy of more than two years. If they haven't reached the size required, then we normally would say they should be optimized with antiplatelet and statin, and also optimize the other risk factors such as hypertension and diabetes. So most of the small abdominal aortic aneurysm by definition, I think less than 5.5 centimeter are now normally monitored in the aneurysm surveillance clinic. And treatment is recommended if, for example, they become symptomatic, either they, if they develop abdominal pain or tenderness overlying the abdominal aortic aneurysm or rapid growth. And how fast is rapid? Rapid growth is defined as any uh, aneurysm will change more than 0.5 centimeter over six months or more than one centimeter over a year. And we know the rapid growth can increase the risk of aneurysm rupture. And this is based on Laplace law, where tension within the wall is proportional to its radius and increasing uh, vessel diameter can increase the risk of stress and increase the risk of perforation. The rupture risk, so as we mentioned before, based on Laplace law, on the left, as you can see, as the aortic diameter increases, the risk of rupture increases. So normally, we would consider treating when it gets between 5.5 centimeter, the risk of rupture of that untreated is between 3 to 15 percent. And we get more than 8 centimeter, the risk of rupture is up to 50 percent. So that's pretty high. So ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, how do they typically present? They could typically present with central, abdo, and back pain or collapse. So anyone with abdominal pay or collapse over the age of 65, especially in men, you should always consider the diagnosis of rupture abdominal aortic aneurysm. If you don't consider it, there may be time delay and patient may not uh, survive the, uh, the hospital episode. Similarly, anyone above the age of 65, especially men with irritatory colic, you should also rule out ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. I will illustrate why they get that in the subsequent slides. So typically with this uh, patient, they get a retroperitoneal hematoma, and the hematoma will extrinsically compress the ureter, typically on the left side as the aorta is more to the left and the IVC to the right, and they will then compress the ureter, and the ureter will undergo increased peristalsis to uh, overcome the extrinsic compression, and that will then present as uh, pain that patients often get. And often the rupture AAA patients will have evidence of hemodynamic compromise. And on clinical examination, there'll be evidence of tenderness overlying the parsitile expansile mass. What about the mortality? This is what we were taught traditionally with rupture AAA. 50% of patients don't make it to the hospital, out of those who make it to the hospital, 50% of those don't make it to the theatre, and out of those who survive, um, those who make it to the theatre, 50% of them do not survive. So overall, the mortality of rupture AAA could be as high as 80%. So let's quickly look at the case history now. How would you manage this patient? This is a 65-year-old man, admitted to a surgical ward with left loin to groin pain, and the GP diagnosed left uteric colic, which would be consistent with what he's presented with. This is a first week on call as a surgical F1. He's been called to the ward as the patient has now collapsed next to his bed. We know he has past medical history of hypertension, he's a smoker, on examination, GCS of 14, blood pressure of 96 over 54, heart rate of 105. So it's showing signs of shock, abdominal soft, but tender of the past our mass. So yeah, no prizes for guessing this. This is most likely a ruptured triple A. So we're gonna do a quick poll now. This is gonna be for, for the next 30 seconds. This will be up on your screen for the next 30 seconds. 
what would you do for these patients? Conservative management, central lung and fluid resuscitation, large ball cannula and hall of fluid boluses, KUB to rule out ureteric stone, or wait for senior review. Okay, let's just see what everybody thinks, and then we'll, we'll get some time to think about what we will do. Okay. So let's have a look again at this case. Right, excellent. Okay, so some of you, have, yeah, interestingly, mentioned central line fluid resuscitation, and some of you have said large bowel cannula and whole of fluid boluses. Okay, right, no, none of you have, uh, indicated you wanted uh, KUV. Excellent. Let's have a quick look. Okay, now. Let's look at the, the, the important salient points here. The GCS 14 or 15, so this guy's conscious, so that means he's perfusing his brain. You ask him to um, uh, you assess his motor function, he's obeying you, and he's speaking in a, in a coherent fashion. So he's perfusing his brain. Yes, his blood pressure is low. His heart rate is high, which may mean that he's in, in some degree of shock. But what would you do? Okay, so we suspect this guy's ruptured triple A, we know he's going to need some confirmatory tests and done urgently, especially a CT scan in this situation. And whilst this is ongoing, we need to consider all diagnostic investigations. But if you're worried that this patient has ruptured AAA, please, please, please get help early. Do not wait for a senior review if seniors are not available. Then if the seniors are not available, get in touch with a vascular consultant. Your friendly vascular surgeon will advise you what to do. But time is, is crucial. Yeah. Now, just remember, Rox AAA is the only scenario where A, B, C, and fluid resuscitation are being used. The treatment for Rox AAA is not fluid resuscitation. It is cross-clamp across the aorta or exclusion of the leak. Just imagine you have a tap that's continually leaking. You pour in more fluid, it's going to leak even more. Okay. So what you want is really turn the tap off, and the only way to do that is either cross-clamp across the aorta or exclusion of the leak by endovascular treatment. So as this patient is still conscious, apply principle of permissive hypotension, i.e. to allow minimal fluid resuscitation. And the current guidelines would suggest that we should maintain the systolic blood pressure around 80 to 90 millimeter mercury. And a lot of studies on animal models have shown that in patients who are hemorrhaging, if you give them lots of fluid, and what will happen? This will increase the blood pressure, and this will increase the risk of the tamponade not functioning well to stem the bleed and increase the risk of further ongoing hemorrhage. So we've mentioned before, fluid boluses run the risk of increasing patient's blood pressure, dislodge the clot, and cause for the bleed from tamponade. So what do you do? Do you put a central line in? Do you put two large ball cannula in? So if you look at Porter's law, the volume of flow rate is proportional to the radius, and it's inversely proportional to the length. So in, some, in situations like this, you do not want to put a central line. You should put two large ball cannula into anticubital fossa and hold off the fluid unless the patient is not uh, responding to you in a conscious manner. So it's important also to assess how well perfused they are to, to insert a urinary catheter as a, as a, a surrogate marker for perfusion. So you've seen this patient, you've inserted two large ball cannula, you put a urinary catheter in, what else are you going to do? So this is a very good, simple, um, systematic way of investigating any patients that you, you, you may encounter as in your career. You can start with simple things like bedside tests that you can ask the nurses to do to help you. You can do a bedside test such as ECG. You may want to do a urine dipsticks in this case. ECG may show underlying ischemic changes, which may then um, potentially put this patient at increased risk of uh, post-op complications, and you want to monitor that closely. You can then think about doing blood tests, venous blood test. You can do hematological blood tests for blood count to look for any uh, evidence of anemia. Uh, you want to look at the platelets uh, for blood count. You want to look at clotting. And whilst you do clotting, be aware of the patient's medications. Are they on any antiplatelet, anticoagulation, which you may need to think about reversing. Okay? And also, it's very important that you cross-match six units of blood ready for this patient when you get to the theatre. So then we can then move on to biochemical tests, such as use an ease, you want to look at the renal function, the liver function before if you, you take this patient to theatre. If you've done venous blood gases, you want to do, uh, you want to do arterial blood gases, you want to look at, at the metabolic changes. 
if the patient is axial and is suspected narcotic aneurysm, then we can consider doing blood culture. Okay, and the most important thing you need to consider doing is a CT scan. The CT scan will tell us or confirm what is proof of ruptured aneurysm. And in this case, it's a large AAA, and the arrow is pointing to where the contrast is extravasating in the right of peritoneal space. Um, as you can see there. Okay, so once you've done that, and you think this patient, this patient is suitable for, for surgical intervention, there are two options, either a big open repair or endovascular repair. Open repair is a major procedure requiring a general anesthetic, a laparotomy, cross clamp the aorta and eyelid arteries, clamping and cross and, and declamping the aorta is probably the most um, critical part of the operation and perhaps the most dangerous part of the operation to the patient because any change in hemodynamics can put increased strain on the heart and this the, uh, clamping and unclamping is the most critical part of the operation. We have open sac, switch the lumbers, switch the tube graft or bifurcated graft, close the sac, close the abdomen. Hopefully that'll be it, but it's not as simple as that. Okay, there's the other option is endovascular repair. This is minimally invasive, but still a major procedure. It can be done under local anesthetic. This can be performed in angio suite. Unfortunately, you've got to bear in mind that the contrast used may result in acute kidney injuries in somebody who's already depleted uh, their, their, uh, their blood, uh, their body volume. This could be done percutaneously these days. And you can see the image on the right. This is a bifurcated stand graph. The aneurysm has now been completely excluded and the contrast is flowing nicely within the stands. However, even though EVA is less invasive, less onerous, there's a ruptured uh, aneurysm uh, randomized control trial in the UK which show that at 30 days and one year, there's no difference in survival. And most people feel that it's because of the risk of abdominal compartment syndrome in patients with, had, who had EVA. But EVA does confer some advantages. It's a shorter length of hospital stay, greater likelihood of being discharged home. But in the long term, EVA does not seem to confer any extra benefits compared to open due to risk of endo leaks. And what are endo leaks? These are flow of blood outside the stent as seen in the, in the, uh, in the uh, CT scan here where the arrow is pointing to contrast below the uh, bilateral uh, stent graphs. Post-operatively, what would you be looking out for? You may be looking out for cardiac complications such as MI because of clamping and declamping the aorta, and also because of the loss in blood volume. We may get respiratory complications, we get laxacies and pneumonia. We can get GI complications, typically they go into ileus. They may get bowel ischemia because the inferior mesenteric artery is ligated. And also that in combination of the, in combination with vasopressors and combination of low blood pressure may cause typically the sigmoid colon to become ischemic. And one of the things to watch out for would be raised lactate and PR bleed on intensive care. Uh, patients may also develop abdominal compartment syndrome due to edema um, within the bowel. These patients may also go into renal failure, they may go into limb ischemia, uh, they may go on to develop limb ischemia or uh, compartment syndrome. So you need to watch out for this. And just remember, in all these patients, because they have evidence of atherosclerosis, please do not use test stockings unless they have pedal pulses. Palliation, if we're going to offer patient surgery, we're going to balance the risk against the benefits, and that needs to be discussed with patient and family where possible. Patients with terminal prognosis from underlying malignancy or poor premorbid condition may not be suitable candidate because these patients may not survive the hospital episode or they may not survive long enough to get back to where they are. And the majority of patients with poor premorbid conditions may end up long term in nursing home. And this may be something that the patient or the relatives may not wish to accept. Patients needing CPR prior to surgery are unlikely to survive the hospital episode. So if they uh, are needing cardiopulmonary resuscitation, we will normally say these patients are very unlikely to survive because they must have had a catastrophic, catastrophic bleed. Okay, let's so moving on now from abdominal aortic aneurysm. We're just gonna quickly talk about other aneurysms. We talked about pseudoaneurysms before, commonly you see that in IVDUs. Uh, and also following cancer director angiogra angiography. On the left, there's a picture of uh, an IVDU with arrow pointing to the, the uh, pseudoaneurysm. And typically these patients have been injecting the vein. The vein is now thrombosed. And you can see picture in the middle here, the right leg is markedly swollen due to DVT. 
and they then accidentally inject into the, the, the arteries, they then extravasate and cause a pseudoaneurysm. Popti aneurysms, these are the second most common aneurysms that we encounter. Up to 25% of abdominal aortic aneurysms have popti artery aneurysms. So if you see somebody with abdominal aortic aneurysms, please, please don't forget to examine their popti arteries. We normally treat them when they get to more than two centimeters, or if there is evidence of laminated thrombus. This could be either repair with an open uh, bypass graft or a stand. So the picture on the bottom left, the arrows are pointing to the aneurysm and the a uh, picture of the patient's right leg is a picture of a graft. And on the right, you've got an aneurysm here and a stem graft across it. So don't forget abdominal aortic aneurysm. Don't forget to examine the popti artery. Idiofemoral aneurysms, the um, current guideline for treatment would be when aneurysms of uh, iliac arteries get more than 3.5 centimeter. And you can see the CT scan here with arrows pointing to both iliac artery aneurysms to one on the right measuring 7.3 uh, centimeter. So in summary, be aware of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm mimicking other abdominal pathology. High index of suspicion is crucial. Get help early from your friendly vascular surgeons if you're stuck and apply principles of permissive hypertension. Please do not over resuscitate these patients because the consequences may be more dire. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wong. That was, uh, that was really good. Um, now, <laughs> there have been about uh, 50 questions already coming in, and I've been furiously trying to answer as many as I possibly can. To those whose questions I did answer, uh, I hope you, uh, you were happy with those. I, I thought, Peng, we could just keep a couple to one side and get you to answer a couple of those, if that's all right. Um, unfortunately, people keep asking questions, so the ones I had at the top of my list have disappeared. Um, but one question, just on, on the um, epidemiology, uh, could, could you suggest why men are more likely to get this than women, uh, an aneurysm that is? Yeah. So I think if you look at aneurysms, um, it, it's an interplay of lots of different factors. So perhaps most of the men are smokers or, or high, high risk of uh, high incidence of smoking amongst men and men have high uh, incidence of um, hypertension, diabetes, for example, yeah. and also, um, maybe, as we mentioned before, this is genetic interplay in, amongst all this. That's something that we haven't really fully understood, yeah. but I think it's a combination of all that factors. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, and then there was another specific question that was asking about signs and symptoms of uh, dissection as opposed to rupture. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll try and give an answer to that one. Um, I think you know we shouldn't we shouldn't confuse uh, what's going on, and and your history is a really uh, an important part of that process. Now we always make generalizations and then say you should never make generalizations, but in general, somebody who presents with an aortic dissection doesn't already have an aneurysm. Usually, this is a, a normal caliber aorta, and that patient is often hypertensive, and then they've had. Um, a flow dynamic change that's stripped through an atherosclerotic plaque or something like that to cause a dissection flap. You then get terrible searing pain of almost like a tearing sensation. And because more often than not, this is in the thoracic aorta, patients would describe that as, you know, in between the shoulder blades type of pain. And the other differentiation that could help alongside the, pain, the symptoms and the hypertension would be any evidence of any end organ dysfunction. So if it were to strip out, for example, uh, one of the iliac vessels, then you would, you would lose the pulses down that side. Now, you, you um, have, on the other hand, a ruptured aneurysm where, yes, they will get pain, but classically it's a loin to groin pain. It's lower in the abdomen. And usually that patient you know, presents on that spectrum of, of dying or just about to be dead or you know, just drops dead at home. So th there is pain in both. There is cardiovascular instability in both, but there's definitely hypotension in one and definitely hypertension in another. Um, another quick question, Mr. Wong, why uh, or what is a mycotic aneurysm and, uh, and how does it come or how does it form? Can okay. you just give us a very short answer on that one? Right. A mycotic aneurysm is an infection from somewhere else that's seeded um, into the, the vessel wall, and then the bacteria could then sit within the intima, the media, to form abscess formation, and as a result, this weakening the vessel wall 
and then the, the aneurysm develops. So typically all these patients will not have an aneurysm uh, prior to the presentation. They will then suddenly present with this abdominal pain and the CT scan will show aneurysm with surrounding fat stranding. There, be, there may be some changes around the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the vessel to suggest that there's an infection going on. Okay, um, last two questions, and then I'd like you to have one final say, if that's okay, Peng. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about the use of ultrasound in the diagnosis of aneurysms. Um, just to be clear, an ultrasound scan is an excellent screening tool, uh, and it's, it's fundamentally important in the screening program, which Mr. Wall mentioned. It is not any use and shouldn't be relied upon to make the diagnosis of a rupture. Um, I think in a his, history context of collapse and abdominal pain with a fast scan that shows a large aneurysm, that's going to give you a diagnosis, but it doesn't tell you the important information of at what level in relation to the renal arteries is that aneurysm, is it surgically repairable or not? The other question, Peng, just for you to answer, because a lot of people have asked this, why are TED stockings bad in these patients? Please, could you answer okay. that question for right, us? Right, okay, very quickly. Um, most of the abdominal aortic aneurysm patients will have atherosclerosis. So the atherosclerosis is not just limited to the abdominal aorta, so they may have atherosclerosis in the lower limbs. And if these patients have peripheral arterial disease and you put TED stockings on, they're not getting enough blood down to their leg. If you put TED stockings on, that's going to restrict further blood down to the limbs. And we certainly see year on year one or two patients needing amputation as a result of incorrectly uh, uh, application of TED stockings. So just be aware. Could you just give us a one sentence synopsis, Peng, of what you think is the most important thing to take away from this? Okay, history is very important. History, clinical suspicion, and time. Yeah, all three must come together. If you, if, if you don't suspect it based on the history, you don't move quickly, you don't diagnose quickly and treat quickly, then you may not have a patient at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Now we've come to the end of our time. Um, just a couple of things to say. First of all, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for your questions and thanks for paying attention. Um, we're going to flash up in a second the, the title of the next webinar um, on Thursday, which is AIDS to Managing uh, Bladder Outflow Obstruction. Uh, Mr. Irving is a consultant urological surgeon who's going to present that to you. Everything that you've seen today will be online, so you can go back and review those slides for uh, Procell's law if, if you missed out on that one. Uh, so it just remains for me to say thank you to Mr. Wong for uh, preparing that talk and delivering that for us and thank you to uh, the college for hosting it and to all of you for tuning in. Thanks and have a good evening. Thank you.